and Springs of Grace Church family. Um, today is Thursday of Holy Week, and today um, was a really packed day. It's the last day that Jesus had with his disciples um, alive on earth before his death, and I found myself really overwhelmed by how much there is here. Um, so I started pondering like, what would be the best way to approach this day? And, um, I remembered I had a dream actually, um, recently that I heard I was going to be dying in two days. And in my dream, I was frantically scrambling around and trying to get so many things in order and, um, came to the end of my dream and realized I hadn't even like talked to and hugged the people I loved the most in this world. And, um, so I, I decided to read, um, the stories of this day, thinking about that, thinking about what is it like to know you're about to die and what do you do with that? And, um, I was just most struck by what it says at the start of John 13, um, John 13, one, it says, of Jesus, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Um, and it just reminded me of, I think what the Lord is teaching so much of our body from gentle and lowly and just what the heart of Jesus is like, and that his heart, um, is so for his people and, um, is full of love, a love to the very end. He wasn't spending the end, um, rushing around and tying things up. Um, he spent it loving his disciples and, um, just thinking about how, how practically he loved them, how he, he got down and washed their feet. Um, I shared with my, um, community group, this artist who has been making something called the foot washing series that I'm going to share on the screen. Um, so you can see this, um, image where she just puts different people into that seat, um, of who Jesus is washing the feet of. And, um, she's Catholic. So you'll see the Pope there. Um, and she's been receiving a lot of pushback. Uh, you can see that two of the people, one of them is holding a sign that says, no vaccine mandates. And another one has a sign that says vaccines save lives. Um, and just various things like that, where she puts people in the chair that can make you uncomfortable. And it has, it has provoked that, um, there's been controversy about what she's done. Um, and obviously it's not comprehensive, but one of the things she said that struck me is she's like, whoever makes you most uncomfortable to be in that chair, like that's who you need to picture there. And just thinking about that, that like Jesus washed Judas's feet, knowing, knowing what was coming and that Jesus's heart is that none should perish, that people who are on completely different sides of political spectrums, people who are the most sinful people we can think of in this world. She did one with Putin on that chair. Um, and Jesus's heart is not for any of them to perish. Um, and that has been really challenging to me, just how scandalous grace is that we, um, are up in arms that Jesus would love some of these people in this way. And, um, just, just reflecting what that says about me and my own pride that I believe I'm worthy to be on that chair, to have Jesus washing my feet, but these other people aren't. Um, and just praying that the Lord would again, renew in my heart, um, the love of Jesus and that his love reached down to me and had to reach so far not any further for, for Putin than for me, um, because of, of what sin means. And yet he loves and, um, the difference is just our response to him. Are you one who 
who stays there and says, Lord, wash me. Um, Lord, I want to follow you. Or the one like Judas who gets up and goes and acts against Jesus, betrays him. Um, and, um, I'm just thinking about how Jesus moved from there to, um, to institute communion, to give us the bread and wine and, um, a way to remember who he is in the dailiness of our lives. I love that it's bread and wine. I think there's so many things we can ponder about that, but, um, just the symbolism of how available bread is, how daily it is, um, how every culture in this world has some form of bread somewhere and um, it's the food of the poor. Um, And Jesus gives his body that freely and that availably. Um, And he also gives us wine. And I'm just thinking about what that can represent of joy and celebration and um, just the symbols that both of those things are of his love, of how accessible his love is, how it's for everyone, but also how his love is um, just this richness and joy. Um, And Jesus in his love and in his desire for us to, um, to move on and be um, the people he wants us to be after the cross and the resurrection. He, he very purposefully like gives us this tangible thing that we can take into our, our very bodies in a regular way. Um, and that it has all of this meaning and depth of meaning that we can recall every week. Um, Jesus goes on to, um, to do many more compelling things. Um, this evening to, um, give commandments that we love, like he loved, um, that we, as Jesus washed the disciples feet, that we wash one another's feet. Um, and then, uh, at the end of this time, he prays in John 17. Um, and this also reminded me of some of the things we've been learning in gentle and lowly Jesus prays in John 17, 23, Uh, that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you love me. And what really stood out to me about that verse is that as Jesus is praying to the father about how the father loves us, he doesn't actually even say loves. He said loved. Um, And just another correction for, I think what we're so prone to believe that uh, Jesus was kind of getting between us and God and God was really mad And Jesus is like, no, 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 it's okay. I'm going to die for them. Um, But no, Jesus says that you loved them even as you loved me. But God's love for us already at that point was in the past tense. So that's why Jesus is even there because God loved us. He already did before and continuing. Like he wants to hang on to us. Um, Jesus gives his disciples a lot of wonderful things. I mean, I I highly recommend just reading this whole passage and um, praying over these charges Jesus gives his disciples and the way he prays for them. Um, But one of the things I loved is that Jesus doesn't shy away from preparing them for the hardness um, that will come, that their life will have trouble. Um, And just thinking about um, what Paul says in Romans 8, that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Um, Jesus uses his last night with his disciples to make sure they understand that, that this world will be hard. You will have trouble, but none of this is going to separate you from my love. Um, And I, I found a poem by one of my favorite Christian poets right now, um, favorite living ones. And his name is Malcolm uh, Guit, and he has a great accent. So I'm actually going to have, uh, his reading of it play for us because I want you guys to, um, experience it, but here is a poem he wrote reflecting on some of these similar things. 
Here is my sonnet for Maundy Thursday. Well, I, of the Last Supper I of Jesus knew I was going to do this. Oh, okay. oh, Judas going out into the darkness to betray him. Maundy Thursday. Here is the source of every sacrament, the all transforming presence of the Lord replenishing our every element, remaking us in his creative word. For here the earth herself gives bread and wine, the air delights to bear his spirit's speech, the fire dances where the candles shine, the waters cleanse us with his gentle touch. And here he shows the full extent of love to us, whose love is always incomplete. In vain we search the heavens high above. The God of love is kneeling at our feet. Though we betray him, though it is the night, he meets us here and loves us into light. And I just loved, um, especially those last three lines, kind of summed up, I think, um, what I, some of what I'm trying to say, that, like, the God of love is kneeling at our feet, though we betray him, though it is the night, he meets us here and loves us into light. Um, nothing will separate us from his love. Our sins cannot. His love will bring us into the light with him forever.